to say a few things before I start talking, which is the first one important one is that I love artificial intelligence, which is what uh, PowerPoint is doing with my um, with my slides, which is uh, just uh, great because it illustrates and apparently it really understands what I'm talking about. The only thing I don't like and I, I didn't uh, learn or find out when it offers you a nice uh, drawing um, for the for your PowerPoint, how to to um, edit it. So I never like to show the earth like this. I like to to put it around uh, rotating it to give to 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 put our brains to think about uh, the continuously eurocentric way we perceive the earth which i think is something really very important first of all i hate those globes that uh, exist in school that depict uh, the countries i really hate it because the uh, countries are a very bad ugly and dummy invention of human beings and i don't like that so when you see the earth from space you don't see borders right it's okay if you are in charge of taking care of a certain part but uh, in, not allowing others to benefit from the privileges that you have it's really very wrong so these are two things the other thing is that i'm always at the last moment including more slides from other presentations i open all of them and and, and still from here and there, and there are things that I want to say differently because I know that some of you are coming to all my presentations. So I don't want you to get bored and I'm including different things. Oh, I forgot this and that. So I always forget uh, uh, logos and the name of the session where I am. So I apologize uh, for that. And for those who, who saw already this presentation, I also apologize. Maybe you listen to a few things uh, twice, but um, Today, I wanted to start a different thing. The main goal is to talk about innovation in education. But since we are celebrating Cosmos, which I think, uh, you know, Carl Sagan uh, inspired many, many uh, of us uh, to astronomy uh, for the good reasons, although not everyone um, uh, understands the importance of astronomy and space exploration in our daily life. So I'll, I'll try to capture a little bit of why do you think this, do we think this is so important? Why this particular group invests so much effort, most of which is on a volunteer base, to put together this course every year for the teachers to, 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 to follow us. It's much more than astronomy. It's much more than showing pretty pictures. It's to add meaning to a very important thing, which is why, what, what does it mean to be human? So I start with uh, some uh, teasers of our knowledge of the universe. And uh, one thing that uh, Nucleo brought to my life, because I, I, I didn't learn astronomy when I was in school. I didn't learn astronomy when I, when I was at university, believe it or not. I didn't have one single class of astronomy in my university. Only when I came to Portugal, I started learning about astronomy. It's when I embraced uh, a master degree on high energy and gravitation learning about black holes. And I, well, I, I was in love with astronomy since I was a very little kid, but then it was reinforced. And when I started doing public outreach and I had to uh, explain things, I remember that working with little kids was the most challenging part because they asked those very genuine questions that, you, oh, I never thought about that. And when they start asking about constellations, what are the constellations and what is that we see and how far is the universe, how big is the universe, you start considering, oh, I actually know very little about it. And what amazes me is that uh, still nowadays, a lot of people, I think the majority of humanity have no idea what's the universe. I remember talking to presidents of countries telling me, oh, I also adore astronomy. I love sitting and looking at the stars, so pretty, yeah. And the next, next day, someone asking me if I could, you know, make their horoscope or it's just, you know, this tiny little star, they're so cute, have nothing to do with my daily life, but they are, they are very nice. And I totally hate it. I, I totally hate it because that means we didn't understand how, how the earth was formed and why we are here and how this whole thing 
is making sense because of science and how we research about our universe. So this depiction here shows how old people, sorry, ancient people perceive the sky. They didn't know what the stars were. They didn't know that our sun was a star and they were trying to make some understanding of um, this beautiful sky that we see, trying to, to connect it to their daily experiences. They had no idea of what was beyond, so they made their theory. From that time to nowadays, the universe became much bigger, as you saw in the beautiful presentation that Naira and Hector presented. We know a lot about the universe now, but these discoveries, in most of the, the pretty pictures that you see, are from the last century, the last hundred years, if not less than that which is like, wow, what, ha what have we been doing and believing in before that? We didn't know we didn't have the tools to go far, but we did know a lot. For instance, I put here this drawing of, uh, of Galileo Galilei when he was observing the moon. He didn't have a mobile phone with a camera that you can zoom in and even make a nice picture of the craters on the moon. He didn't have salsa J to measure uh, the craters on the moon. He didn't have... Uh, yeah, the Fox telescope, or the Fox telescope is actually too big, but telescopes to observe the moon and, and you know, make a pretty picture of their own. They didn't, he didn't have any of those. And yet he discovered something that kind of demolished the way uh, we perceive the, the universe at that time, that the moon is not perfect and that are other objects orbiting uh, uh, something that is not the Earth, like the, the Jupiter moons orbiting the planet. Still, even though we are capable of making this beautiful picture, this was made by a friend of mine, Miguel Claro, a very good astrophotographer here in Portugal. And uh, this is uh, done in the dark sky Valkeva region. It's a, a night sky tourism destination uh, here in Portugal. Beautiful, beautiful one. And um, I, I, I started understanding when, I was exposed to such a sky, how little I really knew about astronomy. And uh, I, I have to tell you this story. I just had a presentation for, for, for uh, the planetary of Unipampa in Brazil uh, last week. And I, 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 I told this story to, to the team listening to me, which was, you know, in Portugal, we had this, we have this uh, program called Astronomy in Summer. It's something that is uh, promoted by our, um, science outreach agency every year. We have, they have uh, people uh, around the country promoting astronomy for, for the population. And uh, in the very beginning of NUCLE, we did a lot of that, really a lot of that. We, we would rent a van, put everything inside, including us, and all, all, go all packed uh, to, to, to the country and uh, promote astronomy. And one day, it was August, the sky was, Beautiful. There were so many stars. I couldn't recognize a single constellation. It was really beautiful. And all of a sudden I look up and go, oh no, it's getting cloudy. And my colleague was just beside me, pointing the telescope. And he started laughing. Ah, ha, 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 you are so funny. I said, no, 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 I'm not joking. Look, there's lots of clouds in the sky. And he became very serious. Look at me and say, Oh my God, you are not joking. And I said, no, I'm not joking. Look, there's so many clouds. And he looked at me and says, Rosa, that's the Milky Way. And I was like, oh, wow. I realized that I had never seen the Milky Way in my naked eyes before. So I wanted to know from you who saw, who already saw the Milky Way with their naked sky. I know it's a biased audience. Probably everybody will say yes. But I wanted to write on the chat. Who saw the Milky Way like I'm presenting in this picture? I was born in Sao Paulo. I lived most of my life in Sao Paulo. I didn't travel much when I was living there. And I have to say that I never had the privilege of seeing a sky like this. So I want to see answers in the chat. Who saw the Milky Way as it's depicted in this picture? Okay, a few people. Okay, someone said it also happened to him. Okay, nice. Margarita, no. Paul, Paul, no. Miriam did. Okay. A few people did. A few people didn't. And that shocked me because it means, okay, why not? Well, 
because of light pollution, right? I show you another beautiful picture of the Milky Way as well, right? But light pollution is stealing our skies. And what is light pollution? It's light that is not properly built and it's illuminated the sky. So besides all the bad components of harming our health, harming uh, 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 the environment, the fauna, the flora, and everything else, it's also stealing our sky. I mean, I remember the thrill I had the first time I entered the planetarium. I loved it. I almost cried. Again, it happened here in Portugal when they inaugurated the new machine in the planetarium. And I was like, oh, wow. And then when I left the planetarium, I felt so pathetic. I was crying inside a, a, a building where they were presenting the sky that I cannot see outside because you're stupid, right? Because we're polluting our skies. It's just like, okay, that is very wrong and I need to do something about it. So that also hinders our capability of discovering more because only very privileged sites like the, uh, the Roca de los Roque de los Muchachos or Teide Observatory, those are privileged places where you can go and see a sky like this. And even so in places like this, there's also some light pollution taking place. So we need to fight that. We need to, to first preserve what's still there and fight to, to change this because there are very simple solutions. Not the topic of my talk today. It will have to be for another day, another course, but maybe we can devote to light pollution. But that makes us not know a lot about the universe. So this picture here, Naira, I, I, I swear to you, I didn't steal your, your idea. Uh, you know, we look, this image can be said that it was, it, it's very old image, centuries and centuries ago. But still it's very present because although the universe for people that didn't know what the stars were, were was much, much smaller, than our universe. We still don't know what's out there, right? We have no idea how big is our universe. We know for sure that it has a minimum of 13.7 billion years of uh, using a light year as a measure of distance because that's as much as light could travel to reach us. But it could be, it, it is for sure, much bigger than that because all the light that is arriving to us now, coming from something that is 13.7 billion years away from us, meaning that light from that object to reach here takes 13.7 billion years. That object is already, because the universe is expanding farther and farther away. But we don't know how much bigger the universe has to as, as a fact. We don't know some things like, and you are going to look at me and say, okay, she probably has been drinking wine during lunchtime. I swear to you, I have not. I ask you, what is time? Does it really exist? What do you think? Does time exist or not? I want to see your, your, your answers on the chat. Do you think time exists or not? I will be giving you one. It exists in our brains. Illusion may be hard question. Yeah, because how do we track time? Oh, we track time because the earth is orbiting the sun, the moon is orbiting the earth. Take the earth out and put somewhere in the universe where you have no reference. How do you keep track of time? Atomic clocks maybe or not? How are you sure that time is passing by? Time is a concept, exactly, exactly that, okay? So a lot to think about. If you take a photon, for instance, to a photon, time doesn't pass. So that photon that traveled from that galaxy 13.7 billion years ago, for that particular photon, time didn't pass. And you can ask me, wait, what, right? And why do you, would you ask me such a question? Because you have not learned that in school. And I give you back the question, why not? Why, why shouldn't we learn all those things while we are in school? Why not? And there is no good answer. You will never convince me. Or we can think about the constants of nature. They are so well fine-tuned for us to be here. Or 
we are here because they are like this. They are like this for us to be here, or we are like here for that for, because it, it is like this. And there are plenty of other universes where the constants of nature are completely different, right? Are we alone in the universe? We don't know. We suspect not. We believe not. We are scientists are very confident that there is lots of life in the universe. But the fact is that we didn't discover it yet. There is no evidence of life anywhere in the universe besides on planet Earth. Right? Why? Because the universe is too big. And to prove that, I put this image here, this beautiful image of uh, Saturn. And you can see, I have to take you away. This little tiny thing here, remember, we are in Saturn, it's here, our garden, our solar system is really very, very close to us. And this tiny little dot is our planet. And all of you are in that picture. Can you see that? And this is very inside, a minute, minute light or hour light away from our Earth. And as Naira presented, the, the, the next star close to our sun is more than four light years away from us. So it's damn hard to see. If there is life, it's very difficult to discover it. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? What if the moon didn't exist? Maybe we wouldn't be here because our moon stabilizes the axis of our planet, which is crucial for us to be here. What if Jupiter was closer to us? There would be perturbations that wouldn't allow us to exist. What if uh, uh, the sun was a multiple star system? Again, maybe we wouldn't be here. What if the dinosaurs didn't appear? Maybe we wouldn't be here. So these are things that we have to consider. But there's a lot that we know about the universe. This is a nice image that um, was produced. I think I don't have the copyright here. I should have the copyright and I don't was produced by Augusto da Minelli, who kindly allowed me to use this image that tries to compile in one image all we know about the, the universe uh, where we live. And we know a lot since, since the universe was 10 to the minus 43 seconds of age up to now, how the first uh, uh, atoms formed, the first molecules, the first stars, the first galaxies, so on and so forth until the emergency of life uh, in our planet and how it evolved. We know a lot of this. We know, uh, for, for instance, that um, when uh, we look at the universe, there are things that we don't really understand. There are those things that are called gravitational lenses. And this is a very nice example of it, um, where you see, there is the, well, this is one of my favorite ones. You, what you see here, is multiple images of the same galaxy that is distorted by mass of galaxies that are between us and the galaxy that is being imaged in this image. I'm not going to explain all of it, but just tell you that it's an illusion. So I'm seeing something that might not no longer be there because it's an image from an object that is far, far away from us. So several billions years away from, from us. And what I see is just a, a mirror, it's, just, it's not really there. Right. We also know now, and this is a very recent discovery, that there are that 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 something that was predicted by Einstein, the gravitational wave, exists, and that they are a completely new way for us to perceive and understand our universe. And this is something that your students in your schools nowadays will probably be able to embrace and study in more detail. Things that, okay, again, a topic for another hundred hours of conversation about this new uh, library that we discovered about the universe. The black holes, the most intriguing objects in our universe, because they are the simplest one. And yet the one we know, we really don't know much. We, we know very little about uh, black holes and what is it, what, what exactly do they, they imply and if they actually exist. We, are compi we have compiling evidence, but we don't have a proof. But we are sure we know a few things. We know that for sure we exist. We know that the universe is full of galaxies, of gas and dust. We know that the universe is filled with stars. This is just a small globular cluster in our galaxy where every point is a star. 
So imagine, you know, everyone is like our sun, smaller or bigger than our sun. And some of these stars might harbor um, planets around them. And this is the picture where I stop a little bit because you are teachers. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a religion person, religious person, and uh, I'm not a fundamentalist in anything, but a few, a couple of things. I actually don't remember the other one, but this is the one I'm very fundamentalist about, which is the dimensions of the solar system. Because people, most humans grow up not knowing the proper dimensions of the solar system. Why? Because it's difficult to draw in the same page. So when they produce books or posters or whatever, and NASA does that, ESA does that, and many other uh, uh, space agencies and book publishers, they would just, just do some things a little bit more or less. So you see, you, you see the Earth here and the moon and the sun, and we are really very small. I didn't know that when I was uh, studying black holes. I knew a lot about black holes, but I didn't know that. I didn't really know. I didn't really understand the dimension, dimension of our sources. So I tend to tell teachers, if you cannot use the proper dimension, then put everything at the same size and write down in capital letters. This is not up to scale, not in scale. Don't do it more or less because an image will be imprinted in your brain forever. So use just a part of the sun, a tiny little part of the sun, if you want to depict uh, the earth bigger so that students can understand or show them separately. Don't choose something that is more or more or less. I am really, I really believe that this is one of the reasons humans don't behave so properly. First of all, they didn't see cosmos when they were the, the, the pale blue dot when they were young. And they have no idea of this. I'm sure the politicians, most of them, don't know this. Not really. Otherwise, people would behave differently if they had some sense of scale. And of course, we live in this beautiful planet. We are capable of astonishing things, like understanding our place in the cosmos, although we don't use this knowledge as, as we should. And you see here this beautiful picture. And I, I use this image a lot to ask students, why the sky outside our atmosphere is dark. It's not blue, as many books say it is. This beautiful blue sky out there. It's out there, it's not blue, it's dark. So what's the color of the universe? Another big talk that I'm not going to dive into. I'm just teasing you so that in the next editions, we are going to target some of these topics, right, Naira? And this is just the theme of the, of the next chapter. But we are very privileged. We live in the habitable zone of our solar system. Our solar system lives in the habitable zone of our galaxy. Our galaxy that is part of the local group, that is part of a, a bigger group of galaxies, that is part of the observable universe, okay? You might be asking me, great, I thought you were going to talk about innovation in education. Why are you spending all this time, like 20 minutes talking about the universe, really? Well, the thing is that um, I didn't learn that in school and probably you didn't as well. That's why we have, a, we have, we have a, a place here to teach you all these things. If your school system was a good one, we wouldn't have a job and that would be wonderful. I really wish that I, I, I don't have a job in 20 years from now because that means that we are no longer necessary and that would be really, really very good. The thing is that we don't learn that when we are at school. And then we see things like, for instance, people defending that the earth is flat. Believe it or not, the number of people believing that the earth is flat is growing more and more and more. People believing in the moon hoax that the man, man never went to the moon. And you ask, OK, what a difference does it really make? And why will you spend your time trying to prove that people put a lie out there to say that the man went to the moon? I mean, why? Why that? Or, you know, there, there are bases hidden. On, I saw a teacher telling a student that humans had hidden bases on Mars. So it's just like, this is again science literacy. And this leads to 
other um, uh, other um, conspiracy theories that takes life away. And we as, as educators need to fight that. You believe that uh, the earth is flat, great, no problem. Find evidences, pro and against, and try to make a case out of it. And if you learn in school how to be critical thinkers, if you learn how to argue and to listen to others and to analyze data, and, uh, and come up with your own hypotheses and solutions, you will understand such problems with a different view and understand and, and maybe have an attitude that actually saves life. So a teacher should want a science, their students to become science literate individuals capable of making wise decisions and understanding our place in the cosmos. Right? This is what a teacher should do. When we talk about space exploration, you could use space to teach basically anything. And these are some examples of how space uh, is interfering in our daily lives on a positive way. So we are part of a project called Our Space, Our Future, with, where we are working exactly, precisely on that, which is how space is interfering with our lives on a positive way. Also, what type of careers can I find um, when I am talking about space exploration? Would I have a place there? And I'm driving you towards my, my, my specific topic on, um, on uh, science education and why all of this matters, right? Okay, so probably you are asking, okay, this is truly inspiration, this is awesome, but in fact, how can I do that in classroom? Because I have a curriculum to follow, right? And I have to tell you that uh, in this, well, I wouldn't say 20 because I didn't start doing comparisons of astronomy and space exploration and the curriculum early in my days, but up to now, every idea, every part, every topic of the curriculum. And if, if we were together, I would have this perfect activity for you to, to, to understand that any topic that you need to teach from your curriculum can be taught using astronomy and space exploration as an example. All topics. And try me if you don't believe in what I'm saying. Now, you want students to be enthusiastic about learning. You know, this, this course, it's, you know, you, it's very frequent to see students say, ah, school is so boring. Boring. I mean, learning science, ah, it sucks. It's so difficult. It's not for me. How can they be like that? You know, if, if science is pure magic, it's pure magic. Every little bit of science is pure magic. But if they have to read it from a book or listen to a monochordic teacher or a teacher that is not a... Uh, uh, inspired, eloquent, or it, it, it's not someone that attracts attention. It will kill science, but it's okay if you're monochordic. It's okay if you cannot, if you're not charismatic and if you cannot give super presentation, you don't have to. There are plenty of things on the internet that can make this role for you. What they cannot do is support students in their way to learning. This is your role. This is your main role. How do you do that? Well, it's simple. You involve your students. You put science in their hands. You put science data in their hands and have them learn while they are doing scientific research. Well, why they are rediscovering things that other scientists have discovered. And this can be, do, can be done from first grade to the end, end year of university. This is a picture. This was a project that really, really, really impacted me greatly. These are kids that are, were completely not interested in science at all. And so we started exploring Mars with them. And we had a scientist, Zetareva here in this picture, that started working with them, oops, sorry, started working with them, uh, measuring craters on Earth. He needed this for his uh, research. And those students were seven and eight graders who uh, were always absent from school, and from the moment the project began, they never missed a, a lesson of physics or chemistry or math and passed with positive grading in all of them. So that was a, a, very, a very important lesson to us. So you have to inspire your students 
with unexpected activities where they are learning while they are doing things with their hands and their minds. They have to have their creativity, their critical thinking awakened at all times. You have to give them the possibility to explore at their own time. You have to let them make mistakes. You have to invite them to do continuous, to make continuous research and understand uh, better their place in the cosmos and the beauty of the universe. You have to have them play the role of a scientist and figure out how difficult or easy it is to do certain things, right? Okay, you, you now you say, okay, this is awesome theoretically, but where do I start? Well, that's why we are here. We want to empower educators. We want to give you examples. And if you have noticed, we are not going away. We are here and we will be here supporting you all year long. Whenever you have a question or a need for help, we are here for you. So we want to empower educators, right? What is it that we want to prevent? Well, we want to prevent you to cause a scenery like this one, which often is what happens in schools. You know, I, I remember uh, when I was producing, uh, present, it was not this presentation, uh, one earlier, my grandson asked me, Grandma, what happened to all these people? I said, well, they went to schools that were not very good. So they were formatted to a standard. And then the schools that are preconizing this model will go to a ranking and they will stay in the first and the top as the best schools in the country because the students can perform better in a standardized test, which is one moment in a school, a complete school year. And I mean, we need to abolish this. This has to stop. That's not the way to evaluate if a student have acquired competencies, if a student have moved forward in the progression, in their abilities and in, in the knowledge that they should have. What happens when you are preparing students for an exam? You are wasting their lives and yours. They lack the interest, they start to have to present bad behavior and they feel like they are traveling to the past without, without all the fun. And of course, they are not going to learn and you are totally wasting your time. What is it that you really have to worry about? It's about the fundamental literacy that they really need to have, which is knowing how to read and speak, knowing how to make calculations, ICT literacy, science literacy, financial literacy, cultural and civic literacy. They have to acquire basic competencies. Be critical thinkers, know how to solve a problem, be creative, know how to collaborate, how to communicate. They have to, you have to teach them, build their character qualities, be persistent, be resilient, uh, be, have leadership skills, be tolerant, etc. And we also need to address this uh, 17 uh, development goals, which uh, it's a horror movie, something that we have, uh, in our daily lives, and that we shouldn't. I mean, in a, in a planet where we are so developed that we can have people uh, traveling to the moon, we cannot solve hunger, poverty, really? Is this for real? I mean, imagine someone from another planet in orbit of another star, all of a sudden see our beautiful planet, and he see us, and they, this, this person will see us you know, in, in little areas that you cannot cross because you're not allowed to and dying of hunger while in, you know, a very close corner where we can travel to in two or three hours, we are throwing food away and they are dying because they don't have food. What the heck is this, right? So we have to think about that and we have to have our students think about that as well. Well, how can you do that? You cannot do that isolated. Isolated, Actually, you shouldn't do it isolated. I'm a preconizer of the abolishment of disciplines in schools. Although it's very nice to have, you know, the physics, the chemistry, the mathematics in very nice and elegant packages. Beautiful to tell the story on how physics came to be. Very nice to see all the developments of mathematics. But if you do it isolated, the learning is not complete. It's not contextualized and it will be forgotten. But if you put everything together, if teachers start collaborating in an interdisciplinary STEM team format, students will learn much more and much deeper. And your work will be much easier 
and you will feel more, more rewarded about the work you are doing. So how do you do that? Well, we collaborate with your colleague and you start putting the students in the center of the stage. And one of the models that we use to work with students is the, is the model of project-based learning or inquiry-based learning. I don't know if you know what inquiry-based learning is. Again, if I was there with you, we would be doing an activity called mystery boxes where I would introduce you to, uh, to inquiry-based learning. But since we can, I'm showing you this picture and I'm going to tease you. Inquiry-based learning is learning by following the scientific method. And the scientific method is composed of, first, and now I'm going to look at the chat again. Why would a scientist do science? or research something? Why, why would the scientist start some research? Can you tell me? Can you write on the chat? Why? Because he's curious. Curiosity, exactly. Curiosity or the need to solve a problem. OK, I need to solve the problem of the pandemic. So what is the next step? The next step is to make To analyze? No, analyze. I cannot analyze. No, I don't analyze yet. Analyze what? The situation. Hypothesis. I need Research to think, OK. I, I, I want to know what is causing the pandemic. My hypothesis is that this is a virus that has this specific characteristics, right? So I have a hypothesis. In order to test my hypothesis, I build an experiment. And what? from this experiment, from this experiment, I will collect data, I will analyze the data, and I will conclude. So I think that the virus is airborne. So if I'm correct, I will tell people to wear masks, and that will make the number of uh, contamination diminish. I will tell people to wash their hands, and then they will be safer, so on and so forth. This is how science is done. If you use this methodology in classroom, it's called inquiry-based learning. So you want the student to learn about um, how does uh, the wind work or about the phases of the moon. You give the student, okay, the freedom and, and tell, why do you think there are phases on the moon? And if the student, with your guidance, will build a model where they will reproduce the phases of the moon. So my question to you is, do you think those pictures depicted here in this image are all uh, an example of inquiry-based learning? What would you say? Are those people doing inquiry-based learning, learning via inquiry or not? Claudia say yes. What about the others? What do you say? Your slow responders today, do I need to have you all standing up? and dancing around your chair. Okay, I think so. The two up. Yeah, let's go through the, the, the images. The first one, the kid is analyzing something. Okay, I'm catching leaves. What is this? I don't know. Maybe I can eat. I put in my mouth. Mm. I either realize it's food or it's not food, but am I trying to understand what that is? The same goes to the pasta, right? The kid, well, sometimes kids cry just because they, they, they need to cry. But this particular one resembles when we are at the supermarket with our children and they will go just make a, a big tantrum because they want a package of uh, cookies. And the, the, the hypothesis, if I cry loud, my mommy would buy me these crackers, right? So it's inquiry again. When I go buy a phone, I imagine that this phone is good because it has these characteristics. I buy the phone, next day it's broken. I made a bad hypothesis. So we have to use inquiry every day in most of the things we do in our lives. So this is one important lesson. Don't tell students about a topic. Let involve them. Let them learn by themselves. Let them experiment. Let them make mistakes so they will learn more. But also, it's important that you get to know your students because if you tell them, okay, 
you are going to learn everything that is to know about Newton and you present a big text of things they have to do in order to learn the, the, the basic laws of gravity or forces, you will lose some of the students because for instance, like me, I'm a visual person. If there are no illustrations there, I die. If I have to read or write something, I have to write some reports for projects where they don't want images, just text. I die every time I have to do that because I'm a, a visual person. So you have to understand the style of your student. You have to know what's the personality of the group of students you are working with, and you have to accommodate their specific needs so they will learn better. But that's not all. You also need to know about their personal characteristics and skills. Are they creative? If they are not, you have to foster, you have to nurture their creativity, you have to nurture their curiosity. Are they afraid to ask things because they've been uh, in, in another situation where their curiosity was not welcome? You have to embrace their curiosity. You have to push them to be critical thinkers. You have to foster collaboration, communication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You also have to take into account the, the personal characteristics, the cultural and social characteristics. Are they coming from a specific ethne uh, that I have to take into account? Do I have to respect some of their traditions? Uh, do they have attitudes and prejudices that I have to help them overcome? What are their value, their self-esteem? You also need to work with them. Uh, I'm sorry for the Portuguese. You have to work with them uh, in, in, in terms of uh, having them embrace diversity, tolerance, solidarity. It's in schools that we start that. And you need, you know, you need to, to help them understand that uh, we have to kill stereotypes. And um, speaking of which, I am going to ask you, what do you see in this picture on the left here? Can you tell me what you see here? Just looking at this picture, inspirational picture, what do you see there? Can you write on the chat, please? Collaboration, correct. What else do you see there? People collaborating for the same problem, people working together, kids doing puzzles, cooperative work, networking, diversity, mm, creativity, sharing, great. And what if I tell you that there is something really very wrong with this picture? Would you tell me what it is? if anyone, those of you who know, you are forbidden to say. Looking from above, eh, it's a good way to take a picture, not unifying, mm, one is taking notes. No, oh, that's not wrong with that. Jenny is thinking. <laughs> Everyone is doing different things, which is good. You have different capabilities. That's always enriching. Diversity brings beauty and, and richness. Yeah. You see, you have not really been spotted to diversity. You have not been learning. If you were engaged in diversity talks, you would know immediately by looking at this picture. It's only white men. And again, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? If I am a child and I'm looking at this, I might get the subliminary uh, information that this is not for me. And this is really very wrong. So we have to be careful with that. We also have to be careful with the way we perceive equal chances. Okay, one conquer of mankind is to promote equality which is really great, right? Equality is, is, is something that uh, everyone needs to have the same change, but providing the same opportunities to everyone does not solve everyone's, uh, issue, everyone's need. Sometimes you need to be equitable. So you need to provide exactly what that person needs, but even better than that is accessibility, removing unnecessary barriers. That's something that is really very important. And uh, that brings me to the issue of stereotypes, which is uh, another thing that is very important. Can you tell me from this picture, which ones are boys and which are the ones that are girls? Let's count them. Okay, maybe this one is number one, number two, 
number three, number four, and number five. We count from the left to the right. One, two, three, four, five. Which one is girl and which one is a boy? Number one, what? Okay, let's do like this. Who is a girl in this picture? Adina said number one. Hayan said all are boys. One, two, and three are girls, two, one, and five. Okay, I'm going to make a different, a different question to you. Do you always know when you have your students in classroom, which ones are girls and which one are boys? Yes or no? You ask them. No, yes, yes, I can tell, not clear. Okay, I'm going to make another question for you. Does it really matter? Does it make any difference? No. So it doesn't really matter. Why do we ask? Why do we care about that so much? What is the first question when someone says, I'm pregnant, that you usually ask? What's the sex of the baby, right? Why do we care about that? So again, it's stereotype, it's gender. gender. Okay, so I'm just creating awareness for you that things that you might think is not important in education, but they are very important because usually we have prejudice and, 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 and ideas preconceived in our brain that change the way we work with girls and with boys. And that brings me to the universal design for learning, which I don't know if you heard about that. And it's more difficult to read about it than to actually do it. And I, I will provide you, actually, let me take a note, um, a link to that in, the, in, my, in, in the folder with, where this presentation is going to be. I will put a link uh, to, to a lesson uh, on the universal design for learning and stereotypes. And basically, what universal design for learning is, it's a, a, a methodology that you use to work with the students, not difficult at all, but um, that instead of working to the average student, you work to all the students. And how do you do that? Well, if you produce a lesson that will help that student with more difficulty in the specific topic, and that one that is more advanced at the same time, I will be uh, uh, contributing to the learning of all the students. I'll give you an example. And in that lesson that I, that I share, uh, I will share with you, this, this example is presented there. Um, if you have to build a, a chair that will be uh, able to accommodate tall and short, fat and skinny people at the same time, one, only chair, the best way is to have the, the ones that we have in our car. If you are tall, you can put the, the, the chair backwards. If you are short, you bring it forward and it accommodates people to a certain dimension and actually it's good for everyone. This is, is what we call universal design for learning. A lot to learn about that. I'm not, this is not a, a complete session about that. I will share with you, as I said, a lesson that will help you navigate this universe. Okay, you are, now I say, okay, she said that, she said that, she, uh, what, that was, uh, I have to do all of this? Yes, you do. I never said, and you never will, will listen to me saying that being a teacher is easy, it's not. And I do not think that the role of a teacher is teaching. A role of a teacher is the role of a travel companion that knows more, that has more experience than the students. It's a person that facilitates learning. It's a person that is building mankind. It's to my mind, the most important profession in the world. It's from schools that the next generation will come from. So if we look at this generation and they all had teachers, I can assure you that many of them fail miserably because there are some values, there are some things that people really don't understand. So the role of a teacher is truly important. And I tell you, if you don't want to go the extra mile, if you don't want to work 
as hell to accommodate all of this, stop being a teacher because you are, you are, you are harming mankind. Okay, it is not so difficult as that. And uh, we will be glad, glad to organize uh, a workshop on uh, the universal design for learning for those of you who would be willing to. And of this other methodology, which is another important methodology to help you know all the things that I presented before, the, the, the style of the student, the social and cultural background, uh, their uh, uh, specific needs, all of this you can learn with this methodology that is called design thinking. And design thinking is a methodology where you go step by step. First of all, you feel your audience. And when we are face to face, well, even if, even if we are online, we just had a course with 200 teachers uh, where we had to teach this to them here in Portugal. And we had to learn all there was about them online because of COVID, we couldn't do it face to face. Good side, instead of having only 20 or 30 in a specific city where we would go, we had the 200 coming to us and it was a much richer experience than if it was face to face as it is in here. So we have to learn how to feel. So you use strategies to learn how to feel your audience, to get to know your audience. Who are they? Where are they coming from? How do they like to learn? Do they have specific difficulties? You have to do that with your students at the first day from the beginning to the end of the year, you have to feel who they are and what they need in order to try. And you ask me, do I have to do it with all my 20, 30, 40, or 100 students? Yes, you do. You need to know your audience. Otherwise, you won't be reaching them. You're wasting your time and you're wasting their time. The second thing to do is to imagine a solution for them. After you understand what they need, you imagine a way to work with them. You materialize that vision, and then we sh you share your success and failure stories with your, you, with your colleagues, right? This is how you work with design thinking. How do we do that? We, how do we support teachers to do that? Well, sorry, sorry. what we do is we train teachers as we are training you over and over again. We produce material for them to, to, to learn with us how to use specific topics or specific methodologies on how to, how to, to, to use specific software, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an example of us training 200 teachers. Of course, it was not 200 at, at one designated time, but sometimes we had 30, 40. This is just 200 teachers that have been uh, trained by us. So how do we do this? And we do have plenty of successful stories. First of all, we engage our audience as you have to engage uh, your students. Second and, and, and very important point is to train as we are training you. Third point, we support. We will be here for you. We will continue being here in between Canary Island training. Whenever you need our help, just send an email. We will be there for you. We recognize your efforts however we can, and we build a community. We have several WhatsApp that are uh, thriving, continue to have uh, communication between people. We have uh, Facebook groups. We have several ways uh, to, to continue communicating with you. We promote uh, summer schools, several of them, several examples of uh, events uh, where sometimes you can be face-to-face -to -face together. This is an example of a summer school that uh, we run every year in, in Marathon in Greece. And for those of you in Europe, you can always apply to Erasmus Plus funding and you can come and join us in this face-to-face uh, -face, uh, event. But uh, you can also participate in some of the projects that uh, we are uh, running. We have several projects that you can benefit from. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about each and every one, but if you follow us in our social media, and Teresa uh, is here with us, it's our, Teresa Giretino is our uh, social media person that keeps uh, making good publicity of all these projects where you can learn more. And actually we are just about to release a newsletter with all the projects that we will be offering next year, where you can learn about all these methodologies with practical examples, right? So these projects, uh, um, you have several of them. I, I have to say that 
I have a logo here that's not official yet, but I'm using nonetheless this one last skill is a project that was just born and uh, that I think Trader Lewis will present uh, this project later this week to you. So you need to inspire, after you have all these ingredients in your hand, you start preparing your lessons to inspire your students with what? For instance, learning with robotic telescopes using this astonishing uh, possibility to have them have their own pictures of something from the universe. You put data in, your, in their hands and have them rediscover something that scientists have already discovered and they can mimic that, um, that discovery and really learn how scientists are doing that, right? Uh, you can, this is an example of a project that uh, is in the genesis of the Galileo teacher training program. Uh, one of the program that is coordinated by my team. And uh, what students are doing here, they are discovering supernova, asteroids, rediscovering uh, Galileo's observations, discovering the activity, the, the activity of the sun or the, uh, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Uh, together with Fraser and Fraser will talk about this. We have students replicating the discovery of black holes, uh, uh, stellar mass black holes, so black holes that are in the orbit of other stars. We have uh, hundreds and hundreds of asteroids discovered by students, brand new ones discovered by students in uh, over 100 countries or 89 or something like that. We have students doing research on uh, light pollution and its uh, effects in our lives or just creating awareness by creating games or creating comics, uh, explaining to people how and why light pollution is dangerous to us. We have students participating in the construction of a global science opera, an opera where together children are building uh, an, uh, uh, an artistic view or, of a specific problem. Uh, so uh, next year is going to be the creative brain and you are very welcome to participate in this project or replicating very ancient experiments like the Eratosthenes measurements. So in a nutshell, we want your pupils, your, pupil, your pupils, your students to become science literate citizens. This is the key to a sustainable future. And remember, whatever you have to teach, work with your science colleagues, or if you are a science teacher, which probably most of you are, work with your other colleagues to build projects around science because science is universal, it's only one language. It fosters collaboration, it requires sharing and supporting. You know, I, 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 I read this article, actually, it, no, it was an interview about uh, COVID and the scientist was saying that people are scared about the vaccine because it came so quickly. And the scientist said, well, what people don't know is that uh, if we always had the funding that we had for COVID, all research would be this quick. We could find the solution quickly because we had funding. And this is something that, you know, and, and the other thing was the international collaboration. Instead of competing, scientists from all over the world are collaborating to find a solution. And this is what science brings, uh, brings to us. One last uh, announcement is that uh, you still have time to register to the Global Hands on Universe uh, conference that is taking place in the end of August. And you can share, uh, please do so, uh, the, the, the work that you do with your students uh, during this conference or just come and, and watch uh, this uh, beautiful event where we have people from all over the world participating. And I end with this message, uh, which I think it's very important to take home. It's just one world, one people, one sky. This is what Carl Sagan taught us, right? And this is what we have to teach to our students. And um, we will be here for you to help you in this challenging task. And thank you.